This is a statue of King Charles XII in the middle of Stockholm. His left hand points east towards Russia, while his right hand holds a sword. The message is unmistakable. The king is warning his fellow Swedes of the perpetual danger coming from the Russians. Suffice to say, Russia plays a predominant role in Swedish strategic culture. So much so that the country has had a neutrality policy since 1812, going about its own business and steering clear of Russia. In recent years, however, anxiety over Russian aggression has surged. The invasion of Ukraine has proven to be the final straw. Sweden and Finland now look to join NATO and become part of America's security umbrella. What's more, Sweden plans to increase defense spending by 40% and raise an additional 30,000 personnel in the army by 2025. The Swedes are also ordering new ships and submarines and reactivating former air and naval bases. The wheels are turning and frankly, they have to. For those who do not move, don't notice their chains. Today's video is sponsored by Masterworks. Household debt has soared rapidly and struggling portfolios could spell disaster. But McKinsey surveyed some of the biggest money managers in the world and alternatives is the one asset class that keeps going strong. Fine art in particular has been outpacing the S&P 500 for the past 26 years. Even in 2022, fine art is up an average 26%. That's right. However, unless you're a millionaire, investing in art has been nearly impossible. Masterworks changes that. Using its platform, you can invest in artists like Banksy and Picasso for a fraction of the full cost. Masterworks qualifies their paintings with the SEC and breaks them into shares, so you can get a potential profit when they resell. The results speak for themselves. There have been 9 sales this year, with the last 3 returning 21, 17 and 13% net to their investors. In times like these, that is nothing short of remarkable. Sign up for Masterworks now and use the link in the description to get priority access. Swedish neutrality goes back over a century. But it is a policy made possible by geography. While Denmark and Norway have historically looked west for growth, Finland has absorbed all the blows coming from the east. Yes, geography has been good to Sweden. But at the same time, less than one third of the country is hospitable. The north is covered by dense forests and mountains, making much of the region inaccessible. It has valuable mining sites, but other than that, it is sparsely populated. Further to the south is the demographic and industrial heart of Sweden. The belt from Gothenburg to Stockholm to Malmo is where most of Sweden's 10 million citizens live and work. And since the Swedish heartland is surrounded by sea, maritime trade with the European Union accounts for a great deal of Sweden's prosperity. Without that trade, Sweden would lose about 45% of its GDP. The Baltic Sea is one of the busiest waterways in the world, accounting for about 15% of the global maritime trade. The freedom of navigation is thus essential to the interests of all the riparian states. However, a good deal of shipping goes to and from Russia. By the same token, many ports in the Gulf of Finland and the Gulf of Bosnia freeze during winter. And since prosperity in the Baltics relies on maritime access, each state must therefore seek to acquire as many access points as possible. This geographic dilemma turns the Baltic Sea into a battle space between West and East. Sweden came close to dominating the region in the 17th century, until it nearly lost everything. From the end of the Finnish war in 1809 to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the Baltic Sea was a Russian lake. In the 1990s, there was a geopolitical timeout. Poland, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania were among the nations that quickly joined NATO. Meanwhile, Russia was left with the weakest connection to the Baltic Sea, retaining only a narrow access point around St. Petersburg, while its naval base in Kaliningrad was detached from the rest of the country. 
NATO expansion severely weakened Russia's hold in the Baltics. So from Russian perspective, the only way to counter NATO was to militarize Kaliningrad. And that's precisely what it did. Russia deployed anti-access aerial denial weapons, anti-aircraft and anti-missile systems, as well as fighter bombers and anti-ship missiles to Kaliningrad. By creating an air-sea bubble, the Russians calculated they could restrict the mobility of NATO forces in the area and turn the Baltic Sea back into a Russian lake. For a while, the strategy worked. The nearby nations put up with Russia's new playbook, though relations remained uneasy. The conflict in Ukraine, however, has changed the equation. Anxious about a resurgent Russia, Sweden and Finland announced their candidacy for NATO membership in May 2022. While Finland's membership would crush Russian power in the Kola Peninsula, Sweden joining NATO would crush Russian power in the Baltic Sea. Though Sweden identifies as part of Scandinavia, it is a Baltic powerhouse through and through. It has the largest maritime domain in the Baltic Sea, with free access to the North Sea thanks to Gothenburg. All this makes Sweden the most strategic state in the Baltics. But the pinnacle of Swedish real estate is Gotland, an island 170 kilometers south of Stockholm. Gotland makes up less than 1% of Sweden's total land area, but its extensive shorelines make it the perfect site for a military base. Gotland sits in the middle of the Baltic Sea and is only about 250 kilometers from the Russian naval base in Kaliningrad. There are many more choke points that could hamper Russia's lines of communication, but Gotland sits alone at the top. By turning the island into a watchtower, Sweden, and by extension NATO, would control a substantial chunk of the air and sea movements in the vicinity. Gotland is also a valuable cable relay station in the Baltic Sea. You see, underneath the sea, a set of submarine cables connect the periphery. These provide digital data communications like internet and private data traffic. But there is more to it. Much of the communications among NATO members, including command and control functions, go through cable facilities on Gotland. In this way, Sweden joining NATO would grant the alliance strategic depth in an area once dominated by the Russians. Now, Sweden disbanded its units on the island in 2005, but it is currently being remilitarized for when it officially joins NATO. Infrastructure, personnel and hardware on the island are being ramped up. Sweden aims to have at least 4,000 combat-ready personnel on Gotland by the end of 2022. That number is likely to go higher as Sweden becomes part of NATO. Seen in this way, Gotland is the single most important asset in the Baltic Sea. Whoever holds it and places integrated air defense and anti-ship systems on it will shape regional military activity. This may happen faster than in other places. The Swedish military is already interoperable with that of NATO. And when Sweden and Finland join NATO, all the Baltic riparian states would become part of the same alliance, all aiming their guns at Russia. So, Gotland's militarization would happen swiftly, and it would place Sweden at the center of North Europe's geopolitical map. Russia would be outgunned and outnumbered. Still worse, Russia's operational range would be hampered by its lack of allies in the Baltic Sea. You see, in Eastern Europe, Russia has military bases in Belarus. In the Caucasus, it has bases in Armenia. And in Central Asia, there are bases in Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. In the Baltics, however, Russia is all alone, surrounded by NATO on all sides. Without allies, Russia would not have the numbers and the space to keep the fight going. The size of the Russian army, combat ready units and mechanized units alike is relatively low in northwestern Russia, because the Kremlin has prioritized hard power in the Caucasus, on the Ukrainian border and in the Arctic region. The truth is that the Russian forces in the northwest are not equipped for an armed conflict. Sweden, meanwhile, is going in the opposite trend. Stockholm plans to increase defense spending by 40% between 2021 and 2025. It wants to raise the number of personnel in the army from 60,000 to 90,000 by 2025. 
It is also ordering new ships and submarines and reactivating former air and naval bases. These rapid developments are noteworthy because Sweden is a deeply rooted naval power, with naval traditions going back to the Viking era. Even today, Sweden maintains the largest fleet in the Baltic Sea, with a total of 164 combat ships to Russia's 59 ships. Granted, most of Sweden's vessels are combat boats, but even without those, the naval capabilities of Russia and Sweden come pretty close. With so many new developments in Russia's borderlands, the militarization of Ukraine, the Baltics, Finland, and now Sweden's militarization of the naval domain in the Baltic Sea, Russia is facing an uncertain strategic future. It will be more exposed than it has been in centuries. Sweden joining NATO will tip the scales in the Baltics, and that's the last thing Russia needs. Because it cannot handle another crisis. The Kremlin schedule, as it stands, is already full. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. Help us to beat YouTube's algorithm by sharing, liking and commenting on this video. And remember to hit the bell icon to receive further notifications. Thank you for watching and so on.